so what you gon' do? Spend it with my family, chill with the crew. We gon' share gifts, you don't have to spend loot. We celebrate culture, our African roots. Yeah. Welcome to night three of Kwanzaa. Habar Ghani, what's the news? December the 28th, today's principle is Ujima, collective work and responsibility. Today, we light the green candle. The principle of Ujima is to build and maintain our community together and make our brothers and sister problems our problems and to solve them together. Habaragani. Ujima! Ujima. Ujima means collective work and responsibility to build and maintain our community together and make our brothers and sisters problems our problems and solve them together. Yes, it is. And of course, with events happening around the world like black, black health care disparities and specific social justice events and issues that have taken place, it was through this principle's definition that collective work and responsibility have definitely made America listen. It's because of black folks' determination to be heard that a new conversation will sparkle like never before. And tonight, we have two activists of our very own <laughs> sitting right here with us. So please, welcome to our celebration, um, Kamaya Factory, um, the owner or founder, president of the Black Freedom Factory. And if you can give us a brief bio of yourself, if you don't mind. Uh, yes, so I am from Austin, Texas. I graduated from UTSA, where I studied political science with a minor in legal studies. And I started organizing in my community. I co-founded Hashtag Change Rape Culture, um, an organization dedicated to advocating for survivors of sexual assault and violence. Uh, and from there, I organized the George Floyd protests over the summer um, and started the Black Freedom Factory. I co-founded that with Christian Reed Okba. Um, I direct data-driven activism in the city and accountabil accountability measures for local government and politics um, as it pertains to race relations, uh, equity, and diversity in the workplace. Wow, what Fire a lot of activism there. <laughs> uh, that was just the surface, too. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> and we also have, Shalanda, you want to introduce our <clears throat> second guest? Yes. Or, you know, you could do it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> this is Tiffany Jones. Sorry, someone's calling her. This is Tiffany Jones Smith of the Texas Kidney Foundation. Welcome, mm -hmm. welcome. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of the Texas Kidney Foundation. Um, and I would say that my, my call uh, to activism like started very young. <laughs> I was, uh, the first thing that I ever organized was a a uh, soup kitchen for for uh, people who were displaced from their country and in another country that that I was living in at the time, and then started working from there. But uh, uh, my my undergraduate is from Baylor University. Uh, my graduate level work is at Harvard University, um, and I believe in economic empowerment. I work specifically towards uh, healthcare disparities and stopping them among uh, the African American community because I have lost nine family members to chronic kidney disease. I firmly believe that it is because of uh, an algorithm that adjusts for uh, ethnicity mm -hmm. and uh, I've been working vigorously to stop it and started a, a radio show too um, during the pandemic just to mm -hmm. say to that demographic that is so poorly educated about what black people are and what we do, uh, here we are and we're not going away. <laughs> so mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah, so that's a little bit about, about me. Yes, mm -hmm. I think that's extremely important and I think you pretty much touched on one of the things that we wanted to ask, um, being with everything that's been going on this year, 
why would you say it's super important um, to provide organizations or provide movements, initiatives centered yeah, around, sure. yes, <laughs> centered around social equity and justice and fairness. But I think I want to get a little more deeper and specific. I know you said economic empowerment is definitely a passion for you. Um, maybe Kamaya, can you share what what has been outside of, of course, um, police brutality, which we know is a super huge issue here in America um, for, for our community, or is it that? What would you say has been one of the major, major issues that has really lit the fire for you to start your journey as a social activist that really pumped forward you creating or stepping up to create um, Black Freedom Factory? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and my name is pronounced Kimia. I it's it's one of those things. Um, you know, it's okay, girl. We black people, we know, yeah. right? <laughs> it's important. It's important. It's important. I'm like, and I'm just saying, it's okay, girl. Kimia, Kimia. My apologies. Well, I there's a, there are a number of events throughout history about you know how black folk have been treated, how our bodies mm -hmm. have been used, mm -hmm. uh, and just anti-blackness, how rampant it is. But for me, it was Trayvon Martin. Um, I was a teenager whenever he was murdered and Mike Brown um, and I watched the Baltimore riots um, I was a senior in college and so I mean in high in high school um, and that made me decide to study politics and really apply uh, my experience my lived experience to share with others and to listen to others and so um, that's how organizing started for me uh, watching black people be murdered on video camera um, as cell phones you know be progressed and technology progressed we have to watch our people be executed publicly and watch it resurface on the media um, and it's just a, a grotesque nature to live in and we have to keep pushing and have movements because we, we are products of a system um, but Afrofuturism says we're so much more than that. We are not products. We are not capital. Uh, we are beautiful, lived human, uh, lived human beings with experiences that mm -hmm. should persevere mm -hmm. in the future. Yeah. Um, and so, that's the the root of my activism. I love it. No, me too. I love it. I love your passion. Yeah. Your passion is definitely enduring, and you can feel it just sitting here. So, yes. And um, for yourself, I mean, I know you said it, economic empowerment. Anything? Anything? Any other notes you would like to add to that? I guess. Uh, yes, the fact that, that in terms of health care, we have a very sick population. Mm -hmm. We have a very sick population and we've been, been given a line of, of rhetoric that is false. You know, because I think we're the only group that, that words like non-compliant are used. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, always putting the onus back onto onto the patient, onto the person who is, who is suffering from an illness. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's wrong, you know? I, uh, I used to weigh 340 pounds. And yes, there was an empowerment that I had to take of my own health. But I had to undertake that myself and figure out what it was that I needed to do. And I unplugged from television for about three and a half years and changed how I thought. And, what I was doing and, and how I was in, you know, ordering my life. Uh, but I, I feel like with, with us, no matter what we do, if we're jumping tall buildings in a single bound, it's still not enough. Because all a certain segment of people can see is this, mm -hmm. which is beautiful, by the way and should not be viewed with any sort of negativity. And I refuse to believe that, that my 10-year-old and my 8-year-old are uh, going to grow up in a world where people can, will continue to be, to be uh, murdered, to be slain, and no justice at the end. Mm -hmm. So 8 minutes and 46 seconds changed my life because I was like, there can be no more of this without me saying something because silence is complicity in this nonsense that we see happening right now. You know, and so as somebody who's about, who's approaching 50, you all inspired me. And I was like, all these, 
all of these young people, I always say all these kids, all these young people, they don't deserve to have kids grow up in this. And the rest of us have to support it. We have to support you and your voices uh, and not side with people who are saying this is riots. It's not riots. Uh, and you know what? People get pissed off when they keep getting screwed over. Mm. So. 2020 has been a year of accountability. Yeah, for sure. and it should be. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask the question to Kamia, kind of based off of what you were saying about the everyone saying that you know our peaceful protests are rights. And I know that you were the one who organized the peaceful protests for after George Floyd's death, I believe, right? Mm -hmm. um, I just I was out there that day, and it was so many people, and it was just it was a beautiful thing to see all these different people from all different types of races and ethnicities come out to support. Um, I just want to kind of, I guess, hear a little bit about, you know, the organization of it, what you think or what peaceful protests actually mean. And so our viewers will know they're not riots. We're not going out yes. there acting all crazy. What was the purpose of us being out there? If you'd like to. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, and I, I say this all the time, that week when he died, um, I, I, I took it very hard. We all did. Mm -hmm. uh, like I mourned. And um, I remember, I felt something shift in the universe. Like I almost felt like I was called. And I tweeted, I just tweeted, I said, you know what, rise up San Antonio. Everybody was silent, everybody was silent. Everywhere else in the country was, you know, supporting George Floyd. And I said, rise up San Antonio, let's, let's gather for this. Um, and that's when it took off, like the numbers just went up and it was, it was like the city was waiting for someone to call something to action. Um, they were waiting for you. <laughs> I, I now realize that. <laughs> um, but at the time, I just I had to go. It was go time. There were two days. Um, and I also had to grapple with the fact that we were in a pandemic um, mm -hmm. and that it was the middle of May. It was hot outside. Uh, and I had to consider folks' disabilities um, mm -hmm. and, and abilities. And right, and just there was so much to stomach. Um, but community. Community got me through it. Um, paramedics from all over the state were messaging me saying, how can I come and set up um, and help? Um, people were saying, I have work that day, but can I drop off water? Mm -hmm. And so it was beautiful to watch the community come together at a time um, of a global pandemic, right? Where we see the administration nonchalantly denying the virus, then acknowledging that it exists, then you know marginalizing groups and people. Um, to see community in that moment was beautiful and I knew that I had to carry out this protest. So myself and some other community organizations, we came together. I remember as the crowd grew, my eyes, my stomach, you know, everything just, it just, it was a moment that I'll never forget. Um, and I'm still li reliving it to this day. Uh, I didn't really know, I, I guess you could say, I didn't really know um, that that would start the protest for the summer. Uh, and that was a beautiful moment. But yes, emphasizing that it was a peaceful protest was also something that I had to do because the media wanted to villainize black folk. They wanted to make us look like we were just these rioters with no sense, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I had to reinstill that. It was important for a black person, a black organizer to go on camera and say, yes, I organized this. This is a peaceful protest. Stand six feet apart, drink some water, and wear your masks. It was important for that kind of execution to happen because they were waiting for us to be negligent. They were waiting to blame black populations for spreading COVID. And so I had to foresee that. Um, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. It was nothing but love. And I remember vividly, I don't know if you remember me saying, I was saying, if someone in the crowd is hateful, don't even acknowledge it. Mm -hmm. We don't have space for that. Today we're celebrating George Floyd's life. Mm -hmm. We're celebrating his legacy and Breonna Taylor's legacy and everybody who has died because of this. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I, I had no words. Transformational. Mm -hmm. yeah. I remember being there. <laughs> I think that George Floyd's death was, um, I don't even know, I have a son, I have, I have kids, and they have like TikTok and all that other stupid stuff. And um, I think that, um, I don't know, I like, you can obviously, I, we had the Ahmaud Aubrey happen, and you saw it on camera, but I think George Floyd, because you saw him actively crying and crying out for his mom, it just really hit home for a lot of people. And I could not watch the video at first because Ahmaud had just happened. I still wasn't even over that, so it was just, 
for you to have organized something like that, it was very and beautiful for us to be able to go out and, and express you. how we felt. So Give purpose to the emotion. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's what we need. We are very emotional people. We are. With reason. Um, very spiritual. Very just in tune, right? With uh, the, the different elements that make up all of who we are. But providing a purpose to that, a direction to that. I'm with you. You definitely had the calling for that. And it was it was a beautiful a beautiful uh, set up <laughs> for an amazing, amazing movement. Now you have Black Freedom Factory, and man, the sky's the limit, and then some for where you're gonna go. So and change exciting. rape culture. Oh, change, change rape yeah. culture. Thank yes. you. No, no, absolutely, we can't forget that. Mm-hmm. That's huge. Yep. Thank you. So well, I can't wait to see where you're gonna be in ten years, mm-hmm. five years. Anyway, okay, I'm sorry, this is your show. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no. <laughs> we need foresight. <laughs> Thinking of the future is important mm-hmm. as well. I mean, it speaks to what we're doing here today. Um, we're leaving legacy for those coming after us. We're trying to shed light on an amazing um, holiday celebration that was put forth for African Americans and Pan African community, something that I don't think gets enough light, enough attention. So we felt like Juneteenth became um, more popularized or what have you. Um, Although real Southerners, we've been celebrating (laughs) Juneteenth or at least knew of it and so super grateful um, that now the rest of the world knows about it or at least the rest of um, North America. (laughs) But, um, But yes, what we're doing today is extremely, extremely important. And to be able to sit here with you two ladies and speak on the importance of collective work responsibility and how we each have a piece of the puzzle to play um, and just finding, I don't know, finding out what that is. I think that's the most important part for me, right, listening to you. It's about no one feeling um, too small to do anything. We all have a role. Figure out what that is and do it to the best of your ability. That's it. It's really that simple, <laughs> seriously. And as 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 we continue to sit with other people, as you get an idea, other creatives get ideas. Like we've been sitting here talking to amazing people, all with great things to share. And I think all all I see here is just a beautiful woven fabric of excellence. Um, give me some adjectives, y'all. Come on, throw out the best ones you can think of. That's what we're at. I'm sorry, we have to speak this energy into the room. I'm, well, I have, I I'm have channeling. To, I have a question me. for um, to see. Tiffany. We'd love to see it. As um, one of the, you, you said earlier that you were a holder. So I'm not sure. <laughs> no, no, go ahead. How important yeah. is it that you, you think it is for um, the guidance from you, your wisdom being passed down to people like Camilla and Shamika and myself who are out here trying to do things? How important is it to you to be able to help guide and share your wisdom and mentorship? Oh, I, I feel honored to be able to, to do that. And I feel like my role and the role of people in, in, in my age group is to go out and pave the way for you. There are some things, like for example, I spent the week working on policy because mm-hmm. when you're out there marching, the the end to that is mm-hmm. policy. Yeah. Policy has to That's change. True. So working on, okay, I know where we need to go mm-hmm. to uh, change the, the policy. I know I who that. I need to talk to mm-hmm. to do that. So let me go gird up these, these uh, uh, movements and push for what's right within uh, chronic kidney disease. Mm-hmm. So going after policy change. I just finished writing a, um, working on a white paper to tell the state of Texas where we're going to go, with, along with, with 23 other authors, mm-hmm. to still tell the state of Texas what, where we're going to go in terms of education, early detection, which is what we do. We do early detection of chronic kidney okay. disease. So we screen for that, and we know that, that by finding it early, we can save lives, we can mitigate the uh, progression of the disease. So when I'm looking at you all, I think about policy, making sure that, that I make introductions for you to people that, and that's what we should be doing. Like, as other groups do, join together, hand in hand, and that, that next generation, instead of you having to figure it out, mm-hmm. 
here's who you need to know, let's move you forward. So that, that's right, let's move you forward so that you're not, so that we have our next set of billionaires, we have our next set of, of you know, 100 millionaires and, and the people that are making differences and that have the resources to do so. That's what you're supposed to do. Every other people group does that. Mm -hmm. They don't compete against each other. Mm -hmm. They help each other mm -hmm. and help grow the businesses. So that's what I do. And people who know me know that that's essentially what I do. So is there any, okay, I guess I'll start with you. Ways for people to get involved to help you all need volunteers or? Yes, we need volunteers. I know you do. <laughs> you know, we need volunteers. We need funding. We need, uh, and we need your voices. We also need you to to realize you have power. You have power. Don't let anybody tell you you don't. You are beautifully and wonderfully made. You have power. You walk in the fullness of that power. You, when I walk into a room, people always say, uh, somebody told me I was arrogant because I said, people ask the question, how does Barack Obama, why is he so, why does he walk into a room with so much swag? Well, if you're black, you gotta walk into a room with some swag. You better know who you are when you hit that door. You better know, because there may not be anybody else in that room that supports what you have to say. So know what you believe and go in there and, and do it. Just Hand held high, crown adjusted. There you yeah. go, yes. <laughs> so, I'm sorry. So, I know you said volunteer. What does that look like for people who don't know, like myself? Well, <laughs> like with us, when we have volunteers, they do blood pressure cuff. Okay. They may uh, help, help uh, fill out paperwork. Um, volunteers for Texas Kidney Foundation will talk about the foundation, will train you on, on like, what we do, um, the importance of health, so that you can talk to others about it. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us, we're, we're trying to get people to get tested because uh, one in three are at risk for kidney disease mm -hmm. and that's a third of our population. Mm -hmm. oh, wow. So it's, uh, it's very prevalent when we do our tests. We, uh, if we're testing in the general population, we find the disease in 34 to 36% of the people that we test. If we're testing in, in a, a specific group, like one that is, has a high prevalence for kidney disease, like that, a, a diabetic population, then we find the disease in 56% of the people that we test. Wow. So it's there. And if we can, the sooner we can find it, the better. So as, when volunteers are essential to us because the more hands we have on deck, then the the more people we can actually screen. So, I have a. I'm sorry. This is actually an impromptu question, but I would like to know. I'm curious. What would what would you say are the root causes of kidney? Would it be more genetic it, or it's diet? diabetes and hypertension? Okay. Mm -hmm. Diabetes and hypertension. Now there are genetic links to kidney disease, and and I actually uh, just finished a um, a paper that's going to be published in Janssen. Uh, with with uh, 18 other authors um, on the first uh, connection to kidney disease, it's it's in uh, um, that's that's connected to African Americans. Mm -hmm. So it's it's uh, descendants of West Sub-Saharan Africa. So there are genetic links there. There's that one mm -hmm. and and others that are being discovered, but it is. Uh, directly related to diabetes so, so. And, and hypertension. So where can the masses find you? Mm -hmm. Oh, <laughs> go to our website. <laughs> www. <laughs> like, the PR people are always like, Tiffany, don't forget to say the website. <laughs> txkidney.org. Uh, or you can call us at 210-896-8440. Um, Any social media? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, you can contact us on uh, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, LinkedIn. Okay. LinkedIn and Instagram. Yes, Instagram. Oh, like they're always telling yes. me. <laughs> Tell me you need to remember to mention all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, can we, we are, yeah, yeah. Freedom Factor. 
Black Freedom Factory. Um, so how to get involved is local government, local elections. Uh, I believe in April or May, we will be deciding on a brand new city council. And uh, we need to hold city officials accountable for the promises that they made activists over the summer, including Ron Nuremberg. Um, you know, promises about the black community um, and how we can better support uh, black businesses and things like that. So um, please co public comment is an option for city council. They will be holding sessions uh, and we need to speak up about things in our community that are happening. Also, data-driven activism is something that Black Freedom Factory is very, very dedicated to. So if you have any research or any um, news that you want us to highlight, please send that over. Also donations, right? Being mm -hmm. a brand new organization is something uh, to definitely rock with, but we're rocking with the city and we need financial support for that. So you can find the donation link at www.blackfreedomfactory.org. Uh, we also have a Facebook at Black Freedom Factory. We have an Instagram at Black Freedom Factory, Twitter as well. Um, and yes, please just support your community. Buy local uh, this holiday for gifts and presents for your loved ones. Um, and just keep that civic engagement up because we, just because the national elections happen doesn't mean that the city elections are not equally as important because more, they more, 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 directly yeah. affect they us. Mm -hmm. So, um, yes. All of that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, that was great. She did it. Yes, that was beautiful. Well, um, Asante Sana to you both for she joining us for our celebration. I'm getting it down. Yes, you are. <laughs> and <laughs> we'll see y'all next time. Cut. The Great Drum. The lion sent out a message for all of the animals to come to a very special meeting. Messages went far and wide to spread the news of this meeting. As soon as the animals heard the message, they hurried right away to the council circle. It was about three weeks before they all were gathered. The lion was very disappointed. We have got to find a way to get everyone together more quickly, shouted the lion. And Nancy had an idea. What we need, he explained, is a great drum, one that can be heard all over the forest. When the great drum is sounded, Everyone will know right away and come swiftly to meetings. Everyone agreed that this was a fine idea. The animals were divided into groups, each group taking on a different part in the construction of the drum. The first group cut down a large tree. The second group trimmed off all of the branches. The next group hollowed out the tree. Then sculptors worked to decorate the drum. They worked hard through many days. On their way home at the end of the day, they would sing, life is labor when we are tired and hot. We work so hard because we work for our people. Everyone worked except the monkey. While the others labored, he found a nice shady spot to hide and eat berries all day long. When they were on their way back to the village, monkey would join them as though he had been working with them all along. Monkey sang, life is labor, I am tired and hot. I work so hard because I work for my people. Anansi watched and knew exactly what Monkey was doing, but Anansi said nothing. When the great drum was finished, it had to be brought to the council circle. The problem was that the drum was very, very heavy and no one wanted to carry it. It was then that Anansi spoke up. Since no one wants to carry the great drum, and we have all worked so hard already, I suggest that the laziest person among us carry the drum. All the animals thought this was a good plan. Each of them looked around, trying to think among, about who among them was the laziest. Who hadn't they seen working? First one looked at Monkey, then another, and soon all eyes rested on the monkey. Monkey stepped out into the center of the circle and announced, I just want to make one thing perfectly clear. I will not carry that drum. All the animals laughed. Anansi said, nobody mentioned your name, monkey. All we said was that the laziest person should carry the drum. People were wondering to themselves who was the laziest amongst them. But the monkey didn't have to wonder. He knew very well who was the laziest. 
He came forward and made it clear when he spoke. So it was agreed that the monkey had to carry the great drum to the council circle. Regina, collective work and responsibility. Wow, that was such a powerful conversation. It was, two powerful women yes. from two different generations yes. bringing it home, reminding us what we have to do in our community. Absolutely, we have to make sure that we're putting in the work, holding each other responsible, and making sure that we're contributing to the changes that we want to see. We have to be the change, and those two are definitely the spark. Oh, they are doing it. So tonight's change agents All right. are also women. Wow. We're going to talk about Ella Austin okay. and the Progressive Women's Club. Nice. Ella and Edward Austin opened their Westside San Antonio home to orphans in the late 1800s. By 1897, their home became overcrowded with orphans and the elderly. In partnership with the Progressive Women's Club, a black philanthropic organization, Ella and Edward Austin purchased a two-story home at 1920 Burnett Street and created an official orphanage. Wow. The orphanage also accepted seniors. The Austins, along with the Progressive Women's Club, saw a need, they came together, to create an institution that still serves our community today, the Ella Austin Community That's Center. That's beautiful. That is. All right, come on, history. <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's program, and we'll see you tomorrow. And remember, San Antonio, stay, stay mass up. Check Bruce. on December 26th, goodbye St. Nick. I light a black candle, look, ooh, it's lit. First day of Kwanzaa, Umoja means unity. Ain't messing with my click, melanated, check the drip. So, 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 determination is the mantra. Constant elevation like the Haitians when they conquered their colonizers. Like a real life Wakanda, true believers. Hey.